Okay, so when you're ready, you can come back into the Zoom screen. And if you would like to share about the meditation, you can just uh, move your hand on the screen. And then we can have a little dialogue. <clears throat> Okay, so maybe Tashi would like to share. I think I saw her hand waving. Um, it was um, quite quickly silent. Um, Tashi, 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 can you try not to move your phone because it's very difficult then? Okay. It's like you, you know, for everybody else, you make us seasick. So just keep the phone not in your hand, but uh, uh, so it doesn't move around. Now again, yeah. Okay. Um, it was quite quickly silent. I heard first the clock ticking very loud, and then the the frogs. And then I realized that this is all inside me. Not that the frogs are outside and, the, and I'm inside, but suddenly there was the inside. It's all inside. And um, sometimes thoughts passed by, but the silence, um, it just passed by. So it happened not so much, but it was good. So when you when you say uh, not so much and it was silent, um, of course, you know, it's easy for us to imagine that we should have some kind of exciting news or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you've just said reminds me of a meeting that happened in Australia many years ago. I visited the satsang of somebody called Sailor Bob. He was a bit of a character. He's probably uh, in his 70s when I met him. He must be dead now. And um, so we started off his meeting with something like this, where we closed our eyes and he asked us to look inside. And I remember um, that I only could hear the traffic because his house was on the big main street crossing. So it was, I could only hear traffic. And I was a little bit shy because, um, you know, I felt that, you know, I should really express some incredible spiritual, special spiritual stuff. But all I could really say is that I hear a lot of traffic, you know. But of course, that's exactly the right answer because you mm -hmm. said, heard the clock then you heard the frogs and of course that is telling something very important because you were actually sitting in silence mm -hmm. and then these things uh you know carry on happening because uh, that's called life itself mm. and uh, today i got an email from Ka uh, kashi and i would like to read one part of it because at the moment kashi she's um, living down in Denia in our house in Spain and she's busy there with the cooking and looking after the guest house and also giving some massages and in our community we have a very special kind of massage and she's writing this to me which I found very very touching by the way in one of my last massages I had eye contact with the guest my eyes went to his left eye I mean, he would have been naked and uh, uh, Kashi would have been almost naked, but they had eye contact, you see. My eyes went to his left eye. We felt in complete deep silence. All fell away. After quite a time, I asked, oh, so you know this silence? No, he said, He's n I've never experienced it. Later, we had again such a moment. I felt it was the most important, most important part 
of the massage for him. He also enjoyed the massage itself. You see, so this is this is a very beautiful feedback. You see, because uh, like many people that come to our tantra massages, uh, they come with some idea maybe. Um, and then what we're really offering is a chance for that man, usually it's a man, but sometimes we have women also, um, it's a chance for that man to experience something that many men have never experienced in their whole life. And what Kali Akashi is expressing right now is exactly that silence. So I find this very, very beautiful, Kashi. And I'm very happy that I gave you the challenge some time ago to try massaging. And um, you've done really a good job with that, I think. So this shows that you, you, you're you offering the most important part of the massage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we've had many reports of people who got so touched from that eye contact, from that silence, that they would say things like, well, I've never experienced this with my wife. This is much better than I've ever, you know, any sex I've ever had. You know, not that we're off. We're not offering sex. We're offering silence, actually. And this, this is something which, in a way, you could say our whole community is constantly offering. We're constantly offering a place where people can enter in and can come to their own inner silence, which is perhaps the most beautiful place for any human being to live their life. So uh, thank you for this uh, feedback. Okay, good. Now I'm clicking, I think the wrong place again. Oh God. We must change this uh, oh, because it's too complicated now. Okay, would somebody else like to share? I prefer you to offer yourselves and otherwise I have to select you. I realize this is a very difficult uh, moment to share your most intimate moment with everybody. Wow. I can see uh, Hannah just returned after uh, a trip to her old life and back probably from one lifetime to another, and she's now back in the house. Uh, so I think she's now a resident and uh, she might like to uh, share something. What happened for you? I'm back here. <laughs> and yeah, actually also not so much to tell. I'm always, there was a lot of silence and um, this, strong energy somehow twisting or it's like a like a twisting it feels like move moving um yeah some thoughts but they were really not so um near they were quite far they didn't feel like they disturbed <laughs> or their part somehow um yeah I, I, for me, the, the online meeting meditation is quite strong. Um, also, if I'm not in the house, I, I noticed. Even in Klagenfurt, it was really strong energy from the, from the online meeting. Yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have some opinion, you know, some idea about how it could be. Uh, in a Zoom, in an internet connection, you know. And before I started these Zoom meetings, which happened naturally during the COVID time, so I didn't have any plan to do these kind of meetings, but it just, uh, you know, existence kind of had an idea, you know. And I think many, many teachers moved to Zoom. And um, before Zoom, I had had public, public open physical meetings in the house which we filmed and put out on the internet. And it was possible for people to come into the meeting and I could see them on a television. So that was how we used to do these kind of meetings. But in fact, when we've shifted to Zoom, 
um, we had many people telling how how it worked very well for them, that they could feel a strong energy. And so uh, it wasn't long before I kind of preferred doing these Zoom meetings. So we've never gone back to our, our kind of weekly physical meetings. But of course, it's also nice to have physical meetings, and we do that fairly regularly through weekends and retreats. Yeah. So uh, for those of you who haven't met Hannah, you're going to find out that uh, behind this very nice smile she has, she has a lot of powerful silence. And I think many people are going to enjoy to, uh, to meet her silence. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for sharing. Thank Was you. it a tough week saying goodbye to your old life? Yes, actually, it was quite tough, and um, it was beautiful. I was touched a lot by all these people, and to see, right. yeah, how how much connection there is. So yeah. Right, right, yeah. Well, they, you're here, and you can, and they can come and see you any time. So you're not just attracting them to be your friend, but you're attracting them to find out their true friend. You know. So uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay. So the rivers in Austria are flowing with more water than before. Maybe. Okay. So one more, <laughs> one more person. Somebody like to volunteer. Okay, Mahima, go ahead. Hello. Hello, hello. Yeah, mm. it was very peaceful silence in the beginning and not a lot of thoughts. And it was like, clear water running through my body, kind of very nice feeling. And this was all my, my inner world and the outer world. I noticed some noises. And then in the third, um, on the third step, step, I could feel like Everything was merging together. No outside, no inside. So everything was the same. Okay, very nice. nice. nice very shirt. deep. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, I think uh, as we don't have so much time. So uh, for those people who haven't been in this meeting before, whoops. Okay, so um, this is a book we published, uh, I think, about eight years ago. And um, this is actually uh, a two-year project where in those meetings I was talking about just now, um, I would select a quotation from a teacher who I had been touched with in my life. One, two, three, four, five. I always forget how many I was touched by. 30 people. So 30 masters who I've been touched by, um, and I took a quote from them, and then I would, each week, I would talk about this quotation, and I would also introduce that particular uh, master. So in this book, we have, um, have the book divided up into seven chapters, and loosely, each chapter follows the energy of the seven chakras. So last week we started with the first chakra and this week I'm going to do chapter two, which is the second ch ch uh, chakra, which is, of course, uh, the power center. It's either our power center or our dispower center, depending on what goes on in your life. Yeah. So um, this is very much continuing from last week because this is also about conditioning. By looking at our structures and our conditioning and shining light on them, 
we begin to be less affected by them. This is transformation, the movement to become more and more open and aware so that these old structures are no longer what we identify with. Then we have the opportunity to see who we really are. I had a kind of shocking experience today because along with Radha, I went to the dentist who was actually um, quite a nice guy. Uh, actually, he retired, but his patients were so upset when he retired that he can't retire. So I don't know how many more years he's going to be available, but um, he, Indira took me to see him uh, because when she was a young lady living in Cologne, it was her dentist. So anyway, I was there to, to spend some time with him today. And after I was sitting in a coffee shop and then we had a wander around and a little bit of lunch, blah, blah, blah. So this, this was a really shocking experience because most of my life I've spent in the open sky house or if I go out, I'm, I'm not really connecting very much to society. Uh, but today, for whatever reason, it, maybe the sun was shining and um, I don't know. But anyway, I was connecting very much with the people around me today. I wasn't talking to them, but I was feeling them, you could say. So I was getting this kind of reading, like an x-ray of, of society. And I was shocked. I was really shocked because uh, actually it was much worse than I can even talk about it because I discovered the incredible density of unconsciousness and unawareness. Maybe I'm being very unfair to the people I was witnessing. And I, of course, I don't have any personal uh, judgment about those people that I met, but in general, I would say that it's really shocking to experience the chronically terrible situation of humanity. I mean, you can read for yourself about problems with global warming and all these other things, but you know what I just experienced today, uh, maybe I was particularly sensitive and quiet inside, so I could, in reflection, feel more deeply to these other people I'm not sure really but anyway I was uh, very much shocked actually and I realized that over many many years of being very involved with the inner world actually I can hardly connect to the outer world and I don't even want to connect to the outer world and I actually took Radha with me and I often take Indira with me because I kind of need a protector you know I need a kind of I feel like a bit like I'm an alien and um, I need somebody to kind of create a bridge between my alien lifestyle and the society lifestyle, you know, because I've somehow become so incredibly estranged from it. And maybe some years ago, I might have made a, a judgment against myself about that, you know, but no more, no more. Because I, I was telling in uh, Radha at lunch that, you know, as I'm now more or less 80 years old, I've only got a bit of time left. And I was saying to her, well, I've been sharing for 30 years. And when I depart, it's going to feel a bit like I was a mosquito biting an elephant. So it feels that's about the, the effect I've had on this reality of society. So I don't know if that image can touch you or not, but that's how I was feeling today, like a mosquito biting the elephant. And if you've ever seen elephants, you'll know that mosquitoes don't make much effect on, on elephants. Although I remember one time when I was riding an elephant, I was riding an elephant in Nepal through the jungle, rather exciting, and we were the elephant was walking. I don't know if you know this, but elephants walk uh, with their feet like a fashion model. They go left and right, and they can walk through the jungle on a very narrow path, about three or 400 millimeters wide path, just the width of their, of their uh, hoofs, of their feet. Yeah? 
So anyway, we were walking down this path and suddenly the elephant stopped and it was not going to move. And then the driver of the elephant realized that the elephant had detected in a bush a swarm of bees. And so the elephant didn't want to disturb those bees, and so it stopped. And it would only move when the rider, the driver, took the elephant around the bush, you know, quite a, a detour around the bush. And then there was no problem again. So, I mean, he, they don't, definitely don't like uh, bees, but, uh, but, but you can't, if you're a mosquito, you can't really, uh, can't really scare an elephant, of course. Okay, okay. So anyway, let's go on with this um, chapter two. Um, so tonight I'm going to introduce three masters that you may not all be familiar with. And the first one is George Gujev. And uh, here in the book we have a, um, if I can find it, we have a bio about George Gujev. So he's a Russian, Russian master, and he was born in 1866 and died in 1949, almost when Ramana Maharshi died. Ramana Maharshi died in 1950. So they're roughly the same vintage. And um, he was a very interesting man. You can find many uh, interesting, uh, even, even films about him. But anyway, at a young age, he did all kind of miraculous adventures. And out of these adventures, he became, of course, a very wise man. And he, out of these adventures and journeys, he brought back, uh, I think, to St. Petersburg and, and Moscow, these two places. He brought back this wisdom and attracted many, many students. So he had to leave Russia. Um, I guess it was in the, uh, maybe about 1920, he left Russia and took his students with him on a journey through Europe, which ended up in Paris. And then outside of Paris, he developed a place in Fontainebleau. Um, I don't know if anybody can remember the name of that place. It's a very interesting name. I can't quite get it. Um, Anybody remember the name? It was something like the Foundation for the Transformation of Humanity or something like that. Anyway, it was a very interesting place. And I would have to say that Open Sky House has some elements of that place. One of the nice stories I've always liked from that, uh, from, from George Gurdjieff was that um, he wasn't just a sort of intellectual teacher. So in his community, uh, often he got rather kind of uh, intellectual visitors. And uh, there's a story about um, two or three of these kind of people coming to visit him. So he gave them the job to dig a pit in the ground, you know, to dig a, dig a big hole in the ground. So these three guys, of course, they wanted to do exactly what George had asked them. So they spent the whole day huffing and puffing and digging this trench for many hours, deeper and deeper and deeper. And then at some point, George Gurdjieff came and looked at the hole and said, very good, very good. So now you can fill it in again. You see? So this is the work of a master, you see, because, of course, these guys must have been extremely pissed off, yeah, because they thought they were doing this digging for some special reason. And then, of course, at the end of the day, George just laughed and said, OK, fill it in again, you see. So this is how a, a, a real master works. So I, through these kind of stories, I've always felt very connected to uh, George Goodyear. Um, so, um, yeah. So this particular quotation, you are in a prison. If you wish to get out of prison, the first thing you must do is realize that you are in a prison. If you think you are free, you can't escape. Life is real only then when I am. So 
So the Buddha used to say, I think as one of his fundamental teachings, that you have to suffer. You have to suffer. And just a few days ago, I was reading a quotation that said, when um, Paranansa, is it Paranansa? Paranansa Yogi, was it? I've forgotten his name now. This famous um, Indian guru who went to um, Ah, Yogananda, yeah, Yogananda. When he when he came to visit Ramana Maharshi, apparently Ramana Maharshi told him that freedom comes when you suffer. You have to suffer. So this is more or less what George Gurdjieff is saying, because these people I was I was feeling today in 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 the city. Yeah, I'm sure if I would have approached almost any of them, they would have said they're very happy. You see, they're having a nice time. They're very happy, blah, 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 blah. You see, so then such a person can never transform their life, can never become truly happy because they think they're already happy, you see. So if you understand what I'm pointing to, it's not that I'm expecting you to be sitting around crying all day because you're so unhappy. It's not like that, but you have to understand how we are living in a prison. And this prison, prison is not something that is really our fault. This prison, of course, is the prison of our conditionings. So unfortunately, all of us have been very conditioned. I remember in my own case, I went to one of these schools where every morning we would start with uh, chapel. And the whole school would turn up in this chapel and we'd do a bit of praying and there would be um, some reading from the Bible and so on. This was every morning for several years, you see. And they used to call this something like religious study or something religious study. But of course, it wasn't really religious study. It was a Protestant study or indeed it was probably nothing more than uh, brainwashing. You see, brainwashing. And I would say that brainwashing about uh, God has taken me years to deal with because I absolutely didn't like it. I didn't like the priest. I didn't like the, the environment. I didn't like what they're talking about. And luckily, my parents were completely not religious. So that was very helpful. And um, we had friends living nearby who were very religious and would go to church every Sunday. And we would, my parents would, <laughs> my parents would make a nice joke. They would always say when we would talk about these things, they would always say, yes, yes, Mr. Sun, so he goes to church every Sunday. And when he comes home, he kicks the cat, you see. So th with this kind of parents, I could never really be too religious, you see. Anyway, I think that's uh, probably enough from George Gurdjieff. As you, as you maybe have already figured out, the reason every week now I'm going through one chapter of this book is that I'm hoping I'm going to inspire you to actually read the book yourself. So this book was printed about eight years ago. And um, I don't know, I wouldn't dare ask how many people have read it, but probably not many of the people on this screen have ever read this book. But this is really a great book, even though I have to say it was John David's book, but, but I still think it's a great book. So now we have another very interesting master. He was a Tibetan Lama, Shongyam Trungpa, Trungpa. So he was a very interesting character because when he was a little boy, he used to sleep at the end of the bed of a very famous Lama who was his fundamental teacher. So he used to lie across the bed, you know, because he was just a little boy. And the, the Lama probably put his feet on this little boy and they went to sleep like that. So he brought he was brought up in a very close connection to very wise people. So when he was a young man, he escaped from Tibet. There was this enormous... Um, difficult, life-threatening even, 
uh, journey that many Tibetans made out of Tibet when the Chinese came to Tibet and very horrible things were happening. So anyway, he was one of these people who escaped out of, out of Tibet. And I think he came to, I can't quite remember where he came to. Of course, first he would have come to India, but later he came to England and he studied in Cambridge University. He was a very intelligent guy. And then later when he was a little bit older, he started to gather people to him. And um, he kind of started a community or a community started around him. I think it was in, in Scotland, in, in, in the United Kingdom, in Scotland first. And later he went to the States and he ended up living in Boulder, Colorado. And in Boulder, Colorado, he started something that became, um, I think it's called a university. Um, does anybody remember the name of the place? Um, anyway, I can't remember the name, but anyway, this place is still uh, existing. And it's became a, a famous place of spiritual learning. Um, but he was a very unusual guy. So he used to drink a lot of alcohol. So he became a well-known alcoholic. And he also took drugs. I don't know much about which ones. But anyway, he was certainly into drugs and alcohol. And he would often appear on the stage to talk to his students completely drunk. And uh, he didn't mind that. And I think his students didn't mind that much, except unfortunately, because of this alcohol problem, he, or not problem, but anyway, because of his alcohol, he died very young. So I think his students didn't like that, but maybe they liked his sense of freedom, you know, that he had no embarrassment to, for example, uh, stand in front of his students drunk. Um, it reminds me of a funny story, actually. I had some years ago, I had, I had gone to London to interview Tony Parsons from one of my books. Uh, maybe you, some of you know about Tony Parsons. He's a very a funny, witty spiritual teacher who is now, I think, in his 80s. And before the, before the interview, we went to have lunch together. And I was very shocked because at this lunch, which was maybe two hours before a public meeting, he ordered a glass of wine. And uh, up until that point, I would never have allowed myself to drink any kind of alcohol before a meeting. Yeah, But when he, he could so easily drink this uh, wine, I, I was a little bit uh, uh, affected by that. I mean, not that I started to become alcoholic or I became, uh, you know, drinking wine before my meetings or something. But I, I, I was touched by the sort of freedom of that, you see. Because unfortunately, some of you on this screen tonight might have ideas about how a spiritual teacher should behave, you see. And unfortunately, I can more or less guarantee you that no spiritual teacher will ever, well, actually teachers might, but not a master's. Masters will never behave the way you think they ought to behave, you see. This is really terrible, isn't it? It's really terrible. They ought to be more spiritual. How can they possibly be alcoholic? You know, blah, blah, blah. So, so this is a, a nice challenge for your own ideas, you know. I remember once when we had, uh, I had gone to visit uh, a well-known Indian master and when he was talking about this particular aspect, he was saying, yes, of course, you know, you have to have a long beard, you have to wear a special costume, you have to sit in a special chair and you have to behave in a particular style and only then will you attract many, many students. Yeah, And, uh, you know, my first, uh, teacher was Osho Rajneesh, and he was a master at understanding what his Western students expected. So if you if you know something about Osho, you'll know that he used to arrive at his meetings in a Rolls Royce, and uh, he would um, have a special person open the door, maybe one of the most glamorous looking female devotees would open the door of his car 
And then he would walk out in front of a thousand or so people on a white marble platform, wearing a very specially designed gown with a special little knitted hat and shoes with very thick soles. And so he was wearing the sort of prototypical guru costume, you see, because he knew we Westerners would never accept him just turning up in an old shirt. Yeah? So he was very clever. And out of that understanding, he attracted many, many people, including myself, because in those days, of course, I was very um, touched by his, uh, his beautiful costume and his big car and so on and so on. So be careful with your ideas about uh, spiritual masters, because this can can you can lose the possibility of a really important meeting out of your own ideas or your own judgments, you see. And any master who's really a master, once he gets to know you, he almost certainly will deliberately do stuff to upset you, you see, because his whole job is to upset you. When I say you, I don't mean truly you. I mean the you that you believe yourself to be, you see. His job is to disturb that part, you see. Okay, so this is what Trungpa says. The Sangha is a community of people who have the perfect right to cut through your tricks and feed you with their wisdom, as well as the perfect right to demonstrate their own neurosis and be seen through by you. The companionship within the Sangha is a kind of clean friendship without expectation, without demand, but at the same time fulfilling. True Sangha is only possible within a container of love, intimacy, and trust. It takes commitment, willingness, time, and patience to create, to create this much needed environment. So this is very challenging, you see, because I absolutely agree with his uh, definition of Sangha. And as some of you know, we operate in our community as a living together Sangha. Mm -hmm. And we have an out, I have an outer Sangha of people who don't want or can't live together with us uh, in the community, but like to come regularly to spend time with me. And we meet together every three months. So I have a kind of inner Sangha who live together and an outer Sangha who visit every three months. And this outer Sangha has been running now for um, 18 years, every three months for 18 years. And when I look back on that, of course, many people have come and many people have gone. It's constantly changing. And the inner Sangha, the community, much the same. The Nobody except myself is still from the very beginning, 18 years ago, or 20 years ago, actually. The, the community started two years before the Sangha. And um, we've had many people come and live together. And then after some time, for various reasons, they've left. <clears throat> Okay, and now one more. Uh, this is Adi Shanti. Maybe quite a few of you might know Adi Shanti because he's still living. He's an American and he's a, a living master who I've never met actually. Um, he, he hardly comes to Europe. Uh, he, he lives in, uh, I think in California and teaches in, in the States. Um, he started off as a student of Zen, Zen Buddhism. And um, as far as I understand, he's not really teaching Zen Buddhism. He's, uh, you can say he's teaching truth. But anyway, I've, I've been very touched from his writings and I can suggest one particular book 
Um, it's called The End of Your World, The End of Your World. And this book, in this book, he talks about what happens uh, when you become uh, very open for transformation, when you become, uh, when it becomes that self-realization is your main priority of your life. And he discusses the steps that bring you to self-realization. And he also describes very well what happens inside when you achieve self-realization. So I would highly recommend this book, uh, The End of Your World. And um, he has other books and um, you can probably find him on the, on the internet. I don't know, you probably find him on YouTube. Um, anyway, his quotation, a community is flower, sorry, a community is flowing and it moves. And as soon as you don't move with it, something falls behind in you. The teaching weakens if it doesn't stay fresh. Your own realization falls if you don't move with it. That's why I always suggest to live in a state of discovery, not a state of discovery where you are looking for an ultimate conclusion. For that's the greatest illusion of all live in a state of discovery because that's how the truth lives very very beautiful quotation i would say because um when i first came to uh, osho he filled me up for several years with the idea that, that one day if i was a good boy and did all the meditations and and so on and so on i followed his teachings then one day I would get enlightenment. And in those days, and I'm talking about 50 years ago, in those days, this seemed very, very exciting. And uh, I came there when I was about 30 years old. And he so inspired me with the idea of getting enlightenment that I more or less gave up the rest of my life and focused on enlightenment. And after some years, I discovered that um, that was actually a very false kind of ambition, you could say. And maybe the ambition I had before I came to him, whatever that was, I don't quite remember anymore, but whatever that ambition was for my life, richness, power, I don't know what it was. I don't think I had really those ambitions in those days, but anyway, um, I must have had some ambitions. So these were the ambitions. And, and then I was wanting, of course, to get the gold medal, the spiritual gold medal, which was enlightenment, of course. Just naturally, that would be uh, what Osho was offering and what I was definitely wanting to get. And it took me quite a few years to discover what Adi Shanti is saying here, that this is a very dangerous kind of spiritual... Uh, concept or philosophy, the idea that we can get enlightened, you see. And um, it took me years to discover, but now I can say without any question that every human being is enlightened. Everybody, even the horrible people, even those people I was seeing in Cologne today, everybody is fundamentally enlightened. However, um, of course, unfortunately, most people live their whole lives without really discovering that they're enlightened. So in that way, you could argue that it comes to the same thing. But, but there's nothing to get, you see. You already got it. And this is a very important understanding because there's an enormous difference between um, having got it and trying to get it, you see. Because trying to get it means you're motivated by a kind of inner desire. And understanding you already got it means that you can relax into that. You see. And unfortunately, many of us have got this um, inner structure of I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm sure almost everybody on the screen tonight is 
having this structure of I'm not good enough. I myself had it for, I think it was 47 years, maybe 48 years. Luckily, it, it stopped. And that released me. It was a wonderful moment when that disappeared out of my uh, mind. Yeah? So, um, so what he's advising, which is very beautiful, is that you live in the moment, you see. You live in every natural moment of your life. So when it rains, you can dance in the rain. When the sun shines, you can lie on the beach and enjoy the sunshine. Whatever life is bringing you is what is happening to you in that moment is the truth of your life, the truth of the life. You see. Very simple, extremely simple, you see. And when you have this idea that whatever is happening now is somehow wrong, and in the future, you will get this special in kind of injection, spiritual injection of enlightenment, this um, can cause you to miss your whole life, actually. Miss your whole life. So if you want to be there for your life, then the whole point is that we need to deal with our conditionings, with our ideas, with our religious beliefs, with our philosophies, with our desires, with our whatever they whatever it is, you know, what has been put onto us as we grow up, because we've all been very conditioned. And um, as we can remove this conditioning, uh, we start to feel, if you like, more and more able to connect to our inner truth, our being, our beingness. So he's answering. Uh, oh, I'm I'm answering. Ha ha ha. Okay. So I in my talk I was answering a, a very common question, which is, what do you suggest to do when resistance comes up, and how to live without it? So this is especially for Atma if she's not asleep, because she's our favorite girl who's very often resistant to life. Anyway, so I give the, I gave this very simple advice. Surrender to the flow of life. And then you will never feel resistance. Yes. Yes, you see. So you, any no that you have inside, I don't like that. I don't like this. You know, all this kind of uh, judgments about what's happening in your life or what's happening around you in, in your life. You can judge it as much as you like, you see, but it, you'll never be able to change it. If it's going to rain, it will rain. The river, we live next to the Rhine and the river, it's been raining here recently and the river had came up and uh, higher than it's been for some time. And then the rain stopped and now the, the level of the river has gone down. And there's nothing you can do. See, this is just the way it works. <laughs> you can struggle your whole life. You can be out of the flow, trying to create that the life is going to follow your flow, your idea, you see, your concepts. You know, I will be I can be happy if the sun always shines. You know, ideas like this, you see, very nice ideas. But if you have these ideas and you stick to these ideas, then you will never meet truth, you see. Because truth is about living in the moment of, of your life. Whatever your life's destiny is, it is unfolding in every moment. And uh, good things happen, not so good things happen. And you have to find the flow of your life. You have to find the flow of your yes. And without that, um, you will never find the peace inside. <clears throat> so very simple. What do you suggest to do when resistance comes up and how to live without it? Very simple. Surrender to the flow of life. 
and then you'll never feel resistance. You see, it's very, it's very simple and very beautiful. You see, but not easy. It's definitely not easy. Okay, so that's that's more or less what I wanted to introduce tonight. So maybe I provoke some question or some dialogue. I'm open to dialogue with anybody. You just wave your hand and we can have a little dialogue together. I try to answer any question. And my wish would be that you start to read this book. Uh, and now we're on chapter two. And just to help you, I'm going to have a break now for uh, three weeks, because in this three weeks, we have uh, the children's holiday, school holidays. So my girls are going skiing, and then they're going to go to Disneyland. So I'm going to be a bit busy. So I have to take a break now, because uh, uh, I enjoy very much being a spiritual teacher, but I, I increasingly enjoy being a daddy. And for somebody as old as me to have two little girls in their life is really a kind of miracle and a, and a blessing to me. So um, I want to give them what I can give them. So I'm afraid I, I will have a break until the 11th of April. And then we'll start again with chapter three. Okay. And if you think that's too long to manage, you can come to the Easter retreat because next weekend we have not this weekend, but the next weekend in about 10 days, uh, we have a four day retreat here in the open sky house and everybody's welcome and your friends are welcome and your parents are welcome and your grandmother is welcome. And everybody's welcome. Okay, so maybe I, I think already some of you are coming. So I'll see you soon. Okay. So anybody like to uh, have a dialogue or ask something? Anybody being provoked? So this is the kind of moment when I'm a bit unclear what's happening, you know. Have you all gone to sleep? Are you so inspired that there's not even anything to talk about? Or are you just already out of the flow and uh, already judging that everything John David has been saying is a load of bullshit and you don't even want to engage him at all? So I never quite know in this moment when you know, 22 people sitting on the screen here, nobody wants to kind of engage anything. So I'm not, never quite sure what, what's going on. Maybe somebody would like to tell me. Nobody, okay. Um, okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, so many. Or okay. is it too quiet or is it? Sorry, wait, just one second and I'll, we'll get you bigger. Wait a minute, where are we? If you say a few words, uh, I get you on the screen then. We have, um, to is change, my volume okay? we have to change the system, by the way. Um, I can't deal with this thing. Oh. I don't know. Ah, okay, I've done it. Uh, but I'm talking to Dominique Gabriel, so you can be next. Oh, okay. I was not aware, actually. I thought, <laughs> because I saw Gabriel, so I thought he was quicker than me. Ah, uh, well, anyway. Um, yeah, so I had to laugh a lot, because <laughs> when you just said now, you don't know where we are, basically. So um, I, I thought it was funny. Because I, mean, I don't know, you, you can you can never lose me. <laughs> well, don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. If I ever get to know what your pet belief is, maybe you'll uh, you'll lose me then. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Actually, you won't be the first person. You know, many many people they come and they tell me, please 
destroy my ego. They tell me this, you know, and I look at them and I say, well, I'm going to have to be very careful about that because if I say the wrong thing, I'll never see you again. So, yeah, could be. Well, no, I don't think so. But let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's give it some more time. Um, I was actually very inspired by by the last book you you mentioned. So I me immediately looked it up. I can I can get it as an ebook. So the the Adya Shanti right. book. Yeah. Um, so I will I will try and download this later after the meeting. Yeah, this is a very um, remarkable book. You know, where he's talking out of his own knowing, and I don't think I've found any other book as good as that in describing something that's almost impossible to talk about. Sounds sounds good, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's let's see. Yeah. And well, the pointless joy of freedom. I will I will read it, I guess. But I have a, a quite a uh, quite a lot of books now in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna, I, lose, since, you're yeah. gonna lose your uh, the the lady of your life if you're not careful. But as you travel a lot, I mean, you have time on planes and trains. Uh, to read books uh yeah well uh, i'm actually mainly working when i travel so but uh um yeah i, I reading is okay reading is not really disturbing her oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah so i'm reading uh because i basically i found you only recently and i only joined Right. Recently, the the sangha also. Uh, I have a lot of books. I'm I'm only reading your books, basically. Right? The the Great Misunderstanding and the Ahams Purana and right. uh, Amazing Grace. Right. So, okay. And I can I, yeah. I I read much more than before, but still, I mean, take some time. Sure, sure. Have that much time okay. for reading. Yeah. Right. Right. Anyway, was there anything that we talked about kind of interesting for you? Anything that particularly touched you? Because these three masters, yeah. I would say, are very different. You know, one was Russian, uh, one was from Tibet, uh, one was uh, from is from America, and he's actually the only living guy. I don't know mm -hmm. how old he would be now. Maybe in his fifties. Maybe I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can see in the book, book actually. Really have all kinds of this wonderful information. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I've never heard of Adyashanti before, but uh, yeah, what you told me just made me interested. Right, right. Because for no, me, he, it's... He, he's very young. He was born in 62. So that what does that mean? Yeah, that's 38... He's 65. Oh, he's about 60 something. Yeah, yeah okay. he's not so young anymore. 60 something. Yeah. Um, yeah, since uh, Tuesday, I think um, I'm, I'm on it, you could say. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, uh, the, the, the most that it's really hard to put into words, but the one thing what you mentioned earlier also is there's just absolutely nothing I want to change. Everything's perfect as it is yeah. all the time. So even at work. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really quite amazing. Yeah. So that's probably why this book triggered me now. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, right. Yeah, I think I can relate. Yeah. yeah well, I think you have a, a hunger or a priority and you're going to be inspired from that book, you know, because, uh, as I say, he has, he had the ability to write a book describing things which are very, very subtle and very difficult, really, to write about. Mm. And, you know, there's quite a few spiritual poets who have, if you like, written about truth by writing poems. Uh, mm. Kabir is one of them, and, well, there's many of them, actually. Um, but he's writing a whole book, you know, it wasn't a poem. And uh, yeah, I was very touched. And years ago now, I was um, talking about his, uh, talking from his book. Well, I went through the whole book, I think, in different meetings. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good.
Uh, we go to Gabrielle. Gabrielle, would you like to say something? Are you there, Gabrielle? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Gabrielle, uh, welcome is welcome to the community. I think uh, yesterday, um, mm -hmm. so he's our very uh, most recent resident. Uh, you can see he's very young, and uh, he's actually studying. Um, what are you studying? Uh, Health practica. Um, I'm studying osteopathy. Okay, okay. So we've come to an agreement that he's going to live in the community and continue his studies. So it's a new a new arrangement for our community. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. Um... Yes, uh, when I, what I wanted to say is um, you, you asked the question um, why do why why are we so quiet? We as um, as the um, community people um, and I can speak for me for me um, it just felt so so pleasant and nice being in silence. And so I didn't, I didn't want to talk uh, because it was so, um, so comfortable in my body and, um, yes, that's that's the that's the reason for me at least um, today. Okay, okay, good. That's a good reason. Yeah, yeah. But it's not everybody's reason. I mean, you have, you, 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 I can accept it for you because you're very young and you're new and you're very touched by the silence you're discovering. And so actually you don't have so many questions right now. But when you do have questions, these meetings are a chance to get, get an answer to a particular question or to dialogue about something. You know? So... When you've enjoyed silence, you can start to enjoy talking. It's also quite good. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> and and what I wanted to say about about um, about the flow of life and surrendering, um, I find it interesting um, when when you surrender and. And sometimes you let you let go of things that you believe you want to have or that you believe you you're going to get, and and then another door opens, and and then maybe it get it gets it gets worse as you could say, but then then you get something greater. Um, so it's interesting. How how there are so um, so many um, opportunities when you let go and when and when you see something different from a different perspective and then you it's like you go a completely different path and then your day like your whole day changes when you take one situation differently and then like things happen, people react to you differently, not more nicely or or not so nice. So it's it's like the butterfly effect. Like or if you have one you have one thought that completely changes the next hour and then that hour changes it's like that flow, it's like, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, just... okay. Yeah. I mean, if I'm now rather old, and so I can look back on my life and see that during my life, I met and spent time with what I could say were five wives. Right? They, they were not all official wives, but... I spent enough time with, I would say, five main ladies that they were basically wives. And one of one of those who I didn't marry has created these two girls in my life. So if I look back on that, if I was holding on to the first one, 
probably uh, I wouldn't have met the second one and I wouldn't have met the third or the fourth or the fifth. And I certainly wouldn't have had two little girls in my life when I'm 80 years old. So we can't know what is going to open up when we can let go and welcome the next moment from moment to moment. So we have a destiny, you know, and this destiny takes us on a particular journey, a route, which is our particular destiny, our particular journey. And when we can uh, say yes to this journey, which is not always easy, actually, um, then whatever is meant to happen, happens, you see. So surrender is not surrendering to somebody, um, is surrendering to this pulse of life, if you want to call it like that, pulse of life. And life is full of so many possibilities, so many incredible moments. And when we can embrace these incredible moments, which are, if you like, our particular incredible moments, then we have surrender. Okay. So maybe we have uh, time for two more people. Is there anybody else? Let's have a look. The gallery, is anybody? Uh, I haven't met you before, Katya. Katya is the lady wearing this Scottish tartan shirt. Would you like to have a little talk together? Uh, yes, I, I let myself inspire <laughs> by hearing you talking. But um, I try to imagine how this can look like um, surrendering to the flow of life. So <laughs> it, it's easily spoken, but I don't know if it's so easily made. Definitely not easy. It's not easy. So I mean, mm. I think what what makes it more possible, let's say, is when you come to some inner situation. You know, when you come to realize that, for example, what I was saying today about the society. You know, that when I was something like twenty eight or maybe twenty six years old, uh, apparently my life was quite good. I worked in a very well-known architect's office in London. And I had a kind of possibility of a, you know, a good career. My mother and father were very happy about me and everything was apparently very good, you see. But inside, it just wasn't okay for me. I was just uh, kind of a lost, a lost, uh, I was a lost soul, if you want to call it like a lost soul. And uh, I didn't know what to do because I didn't know anything about spiritual things. I didn't have any spiritual friends particularly. And uh, I didn't know what to do. But then out of the blue came some Japanese architect friends who invited me to come to Tokyo. And um, so in my sort of moment of... Uh, lost soulness, I took their invitation and went to Tokyo. And I was only planning to be there for my holidays, which was, I think, three months, two, two or three months. And um, But in the end, I spent three and a half years. And in that three and a half years, I went through a long night of the, of the dark soul, you can say. I went through quite a strong process. And I never recovered, in a way, from that process because I never went back to the life I had in London. And that wasn't easy. I mean, there were, you know, many hard, difficult moments. You know? But if I look back now over the last 50 years, I don't have any regrets for the journey that life took me on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know you at all. Would you like to share a little bit about you? I mean, do you meditate, for example? Um, yes, um, for myself a bit. I I really started during um, the COVID uh, uh, situation. 
Right. And right. I I thought what a wonderful possibility is to try to meditate. Um so I made it just for myself and uh, um, um, with the help of some YouTube videos and so on. Um, for example, um, the uh, videos by Goenka, right. uh, Vipassana. Right. Um, but I, I think I'm a beginner. I'm not uh, so much used, but I, I, I make it for myself. And um, it's quite interesting uh, because uh, when you don't try to reach something special, it's the best. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the best moments happen suddenly, yeah. <laughs> spontaneously, when you may be mm -hmm. walking through the supermarkets and not when you're you know, <laughs> seriously trying to meditate. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yes, so, and... So you've been uh, meditating for three uh, or four I years. I also realized... Okay. Yes, uh, about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so, um, is there a reason why you showed up tonight? Uh, yes, uh, I was curious about the community and uh, John David. <laughs> and I, um, I'm interested in participating in uh, a workshop in April. Okay. And so I, I first wanted to have a little look uh, um, sure. to all. We we have I don't know which workshop you're planning, but we have very nice Vipassana weekend. We call it Vipassana, oh. Vipassana Island weekend. And uh, um, if you look up, you may get touch from that if you're interested in Vipassana. When is uh, this workshop? I I thought. Um, I uh, saw a silent uh, a workshop for uh, one and a half days or something like that. Right. Uh, but um, uh, the Vipassana, uh, which one is this? Uh, I, actually, I um, wait a minute. Maybe I can find. Maybe somebody else can tell you the dates. I, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I don't know the dates, mm -hmm. but anyway, in April, I think it's about the middle of April that we have. Um, a Vipassana weekend, we call it Vipassana Island. So sitting oh, okay. in, sitting together in one room uh, with a mattress and a mm -hmm. chair and a cushion, uh, blindfolded, mm -hmm. will be about uh, maybe 12 people. Oh, yes, uh, that's what I, I saw. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I saw and I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Because you get, yes. you get from Friday evening until Sunday evening. You, Sunday. Mm-hmm. You get um, many hours with your own uh, island on your own mm -hmm. island and in inside yourself, and um, you're completely taken care of from the community. We bring food and water. We take you to the toilet, and you mm -hmm. stay completely mm -hmm. blindfolded for the whole uh, from Friday evening until Sunday afternoon. And mm -hmm. uh, this is a very beautiful experience, I would say. I, I, I'm I'm curious <laughs> about that. Right. A lot of hours with uh, uh, yes, uh, um, with oneself and the community at the same time. Right, right, right. And mm -hmm. the, there's also the community of the twelve about twelve people that will come together because um, you're all sitting together in one room, you know, and uh, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a certain energy field comes then, you know, and. Uh, mm -hmm. so Always one member from the community is sitting in the room to take care of anybody who needs something. Mm -hmm. mm. That will be interesting, yes. Yeah, yeah many <laughs> I'm people looking are, forward. Many yeah. people are touched because even mm -hmm. this caringness allows you a deeper surrender, you can say, because you don't have to mm -hmm. take care of your own food, you don't have to care about anything you, you're just mm -hmm. falling you were you're kind of invited if you like to fall into a deep silence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think <laughs> you'll enjoy it that. i can imagine <laughs> you will enjoy it you know because you've uh -huh. already, okay you've already taken yeah. your own steps towards such a meditation mm-hmm
Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, we look mm -hmm. forward to meeting you in April then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Okay, so maybe we, we have uh, one more person who'd like to uh, share something as you like. Okay. So let, let's maybe finish by closing our eyes for a few moments and just uh, being quiet together. Okay, thank you for a nice meeting, and uh, I'll see you on the 11th of April in three weeks. Thank you.